Very beautiful and simple expression. Perhaps it would be good for all, all of them to see why that's so powerful. Here, JM is M1, M2, CM1, M2, M1, M2, right? That's the expansion of the coupled in terms of the uncoupled. So I take and apply on it by JZ. So JZ, JM is JZ in here, sum over. What is JZ in, the, in this? That's J1, Z, J2, Z. And I move it in, C1, CM1, M2, J1, Z, plus J2, Z, acting on. the M1, M2. What is this? It's H bar. Till now, I guess there is no problem, right? Yeah. Times that. H bars cancel. And this one is H bar M, J, M. Correct? H bar cancels. So M, J, M is equal to this summation. So I open, expand this again. M1, M2. CM1, CM2, M1, M2. Can I? That's a number out there. And I expand this again. Then bring everything together. M1, M2, there's an M, M minus. M1, M2, CM1, M2 times M1, M2 is equal to zero. Isn't that nice? Okay. So that takes care of a bit, of course. To relate these two bases to each other, and starting from one, we can go to the other one and vice versa. But before that, I, ha I have to complete my previous discussion with the explicit construction of the ladder operation. That is ladder operation. We need to complete it by computing the normalization. Remember, we said J plus and minus acting on JM gives you the plus one increases the eigenvalue M by one and vice versa. So as this is normalized to start with, and as there's no guarantee that this new one acted upon by the J plus, because notice that normalization will be lost because J plus and minus are not uh, Hermitian. So to make up for the loss of normalization, we write it as such. The first line is that, and the second line is that. So let me determine the same C plus, and I will repeat computation by putting the, these little corrections on the same line. So how do I compute the C plus? I take the norm of this, that is J plus, Jm is j plus jm plus 1. That's the vector, right? And these are normalized. So this one is 1, and this one is the square root of the following, right? Jm J plus dagger times J plus Jm. That's the definition of the length of a vector. You take the length square and take the square root to get the length. Let's see plus. What is the J plus dagger? It is the J minus. So to get the C plus, this normalizing coefficient, I have to sandwich the J minus J plus between the original JM. Nice, isn't it? We know what that expression is. Let me repeat it quickly instead of it pulling out of the hat. This is JX squared, JY squared, which is J squared minus JZ squared. Plus I commutator JX, JY. I thought of the sign first, because this second one has minus ijy, 
So it is indeed this sign. This one is I J I H bar J Z. So this is J squared minus J Z squared minus H bar J Z sandwich between this and that. J times J plus one. minus m times m plus 1. Finished. The G C plus is the square root of this thing. j times j plus 1 minus m times m plus 1. Let me repeat now the same without redoing everything for the C minus case. If I go to the C minus, again these are normalized, 1, C minus, so it is C minus C minus dagger, which is plus. So it is J plus J minus. The only sign changes here and here. That's here. Finished. You see, when you do it one for one, the other is automatically obtained. So we have C plus minus H bar J j plus 1 minus m times m plus minus 1. These are the general rules for any angle momentum momentum operator satisfying the commutation relations. Let's see whether we can use this and start with say plus plus and go down and find the other spectrum. So I'm trying to co connect this basis set to that basis set. So how do we start? So I will construct the S equals 1 case first. For the S equals 1, the MR, 1, 0, and minus 1, the maximum value of M is this. So the maximum state is 1, 1. S is 1 and M is 1. How can I form this maximum value of m by taking m1 as plus a half and m2 as plus a half? That's the maximum value. So, so this is an e there, there is an easy identification of the one-one state with the uncoupled one plus and plus or spin one half and spin one half. So I will obtain. I will act S minus this way. I have started with the maximum and S minus the other way as well. So what is the S minus on 1, 1? S minus on 1, 1 is, now well, let's use that relationship. H bar, what are the S's in here? 1, so 1 times 1 plus 1. Let me do it explicitly here. 1 times 1 plus 1 minus minus m, m is 1 again. 1, 1 minus 1. That is the left hand side, right? S minus 1, 1 gives you 1, 0. What about the right hand side? This is the left hand side. What about the right hand side? I have to take this S minus and act on the right hand side on the uncoupled one. That is S minus on the plus plus or S1 minus plus S2 minus Remember the previous discussion we had at the end of the class, plus and plus. That's how it is in the right hand side. What is the S1? Okay, there are two terms. S1 minus on one and one. That's the first object and second object if you want. Right? That's how you put them together plus 
S2 minus 1, 1, and 1. OK, I will go back to the left-hand corner. What is S1? S1 minus on plus 1. That only acts on the first factor, obviously. Well, immediately you see that this sees the first one, and there is nothing acting on it. This sees the second one. So it's going to be plus and minus and minus and plus and plus and minus, obviously. So what is this? This is h bar. This one is explicitly one half and one half. If you want to use the full representation, the s is one half and ms is one half. So it is one half, one half plus one minus one half m times m minus one. What is m? One half minus one. And minus, right? That is how you go. Decrease the value by one. One half, one half minus one, which is one half minus a half. This is untouched and this is reduced from this one. So what are the inside? This is one half three quarters minus a half minus a half, that is plus a half. So inside is 1. So what is this? h bar minus. So s1 acting on the minus, s1 a minus acting on the plus reduces it down to minus. That's beautiful. So right hand side is easy to handle. So what is the right hand side then there? Right hand side is h bar, the overall h bar. Minus plus plus minus. That's what I got. And what was the left hand side? Left hand side was. <coughs> I, I, I haven't finished the numbers. Let me write the numbers. That's zero, that's square root. So I, if I write the left hand side, right hand side is equal to the left hand side. So I get 1, 0 is equal to h bars cancel, 1 over square root of 2 plus 1 minus 2 minus 1 plus 2. Isn't that nice? You get the from one one you get to one zero automatically in terms of the uncoupled ones. You act on this once more to go to one minus one. I write the result and I invite you please check. It is minus and minus. So at least one M family is determined in terms of the individual uncoupled basis vectors. One M family, by mean, what I mean by one M family is one, 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 zero, and one minus one. Now there's one thing left, which is, what about the zero, zero? Zero, zero state. Well, by the way, this zero, zero state is very important, although I'm not going to discuss that issue as we are really finishing the semester in the context of Bell theorems, locality of Einstein, EPR theorem, and stuff like that, entanglement. So let me proceed. How do I construct this? This is the eigenstate of the S square, common eigenstate of S squared SC commuting operators with the eigenvalue S equals zero. 
And as the eigenvectors of Hermitian operators corresponding to different eigenvalues are orthogonal, this must be orthogonal to the one zero. Orthogonal to one zero. It is m's are the same, s equals zero, s equals one, indeed corresponding to two different eigenvalues of the s squared operator. Therefore, they must be orthogonal, general theorem of quantum mechanics. And it must be, so 0, 0 should be composed of what, using the other theorem, ms is equal to m1 plus m2, ms is 0, total ms, and it must be either plus, minus, or minus, plus, because when you add plus, minus, you get 0, you get minus, minus, plus, you get 0. So it's going to be a superposition of C1 plus minus C2 minus plus 1M2 and 1M2. And it needs to be normalized as well. So one additional condition which is needed is this. And of course overall phases are not important. That's the other condition. So this is how I start constructing it using the theorem as I said, that's a very important condition. I use the theorem in here that ms is equal to one m1 plus m2. So to get this zero, in the light of this, I have taken one spin up, the other spin down, and vice versa, so that I can add them up to get zero in the left-hand side. That's the general selection rule that we have constructed. So I, let me impose the condition that this is orthogonal to this one. Let me write that. One zero 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 is zero. That's the orthogonality. And through this one here, this this state here. So what do I get? Using the fact that plus minus, also use the fact use plus plus. 1, 2, and 1, 2 is 1. That's also valid for minus 1. And plus, minus, minus, plus, 1, 2, and 1, 2 is 0. So all these facts after using it. So what do I get? I get C1 over square root of 2. The only contribution is you get from the first terms, 1 over square root of 2. And from the second one, the first with first, second with second gives you one. First with second, because there it's plus one and minus one, and second with first gives you zero. So orthogonality is this condition. That is, C1 is equal to minus C2. and they need to be normalized. If I substitute it in the normalization, I get C1 mod squared plus C mod squared, which is twice C1 mod squared is equal to one. So C1, C1 mod is one over square root of two, put a phase, C2 is minus C1 is minus one over two. Set the phase equal to zero, so I get finally zero, zero is one over square root of two plus one minus two minus one plus two. Okay. So that was a nice illustration of the addition theorems. We have used almost all the, theory, all the properties that we have proven. This, the, the M eigenvalues are equal in the left-hand side and right-hand side. That is, the individuals add up to give you the total. And there are possible values of the total J, which runs from S1 minus S2 going to S1 plus S2 and also uh, different eigenstates are orthogonal. 
and it's a beautiful set and there are of course some applications which can we can resort to I'm not going to do that and I stop the addition problem in here and I automatically turn my attention in the remaining half an hour to some further elaborations on the orbital angular momentum to finish the lecture for the semester further elaborations on orbital angular momentum here that's the orbital angular momentum x is the and p are the position and momentum operators and it satisfies of course the usual as we have demonstrated usual angular momentum algebra and of course the L squared NLZ or any I really is zero which follows from the, the master commutator and they are also the generator of rotations in space that we have also demonstrated all those things we have seen what am I going to do in the, in the context of further elaboration and I will try to compute L squared and I will try to relate it to something like P squared this is important because P squared when you divide it by 2m is the kinetic energy operator so can you expand, express the kinetic energy operator uh, or the P squared as the radial momentum squared plus and L squared divided by R squared, for instance, which is valid for the classical mechanics. And what is the quantum mechanical part of this? Because it is very relevant for the uh, inverse square potential problems. The planetary motion problem for the Kepler problem is, uses this fact, and the Coulomb problem for the naive atomic physics, you also use this theorem. So let's see whether we can quickly find this relationship between L squared and P squared and R squared, of course. That's also simply given. Therefore, I can express P squared as PR squared and L squared divided by R squared, which is valid classically. That's classical. And what is the quantum? version of it, quantum version. Okay, let me start attacking that problem and I will try to be as fast as possible because you, you should see that some of these things are quite non-trivial but easy to handle once you really know how to keep track of the operators. So L squared is sum over I, Li and Li. Repeated indices are summed, therefore I'm not putting the summation sign. Epsilon, Jm, Xj, Pm, Epsilon, and uh, uh, Kn, Xk, Pn. And all the repeated indices are summed over. So there are several repeated indices in here. So the, what is this? Epsilon i j m, epsilon i k n, x j p m, x k p n. Look at this expression. x p x k. Well, if you were in classical physics, problem would be is finished, right? Because you jump over the x, put the xj, xk, and pn, pn, reduce the epsilons, and you get that, you, you really get that expression automatically and immediately. We see that there be, there's going to be an additional quantum correction at the order of h bar, which is a reflection of its quantum nature. What is the contraction over i? Notice that there are repeated i's in here, so there's a contraction of it. So delta jk delta mn delta uh, jn delta mk which gives you 
xj, xk, so xj, pm, xk, pm. So there's this. Notice that this jj, jk, so. Right? J and J, M and M. That's nice. Minus J N J J P J and M K P K. All the indices are consistent. Notice that because left hand side is a scalar and right hand side should come out to be a scalar, it indeed is the case. I have to move this to here and this to there first. How do I do that? I need to use the commutation, basic commutation relations, right? What is, for instance, xj pm is ih bar delta jm, therefore xj, XJ pm xj, pm xj, that is there, xj pm minus ih bar delta jm. So I'm trying to express this in terms of the xjpm. Put the x's to the left, p's to the right. What is the philosophy? p is an operator. x is a, in the space of functions of x, p acts as the gradient operator. So we have to put it all the way to the right. And x's are numbers, c number multiplications. We put it to the left. That's the reason why I do it that way. It is not out of hat, really. So PMXJ is XJ, PM minus IH bar delta JM. So this first term is <coughs> what? The first term is then there is XJ overall to the left. PMXJ is XJ PM minus i h bar delta j m times p m out there. So what is it? x squared minus p squared minus i h bar x dot p. Nice, isn't it? We have been able to express the first, the so-called first term as such. x squared is r squared, right? The length of the x squared is r squared. So let me handle the, uh, this term. What is the px in the first place? I have to convert px to xp, and we'll see what happens then. How is it related to x dot p, for instance? I can do it in two steps, right? First, I will do it that way, then jump the x. Uh, let me see xj and pj. So, xi pj is ih bar delta ij. x1 p1 minus p1 x1 is ih bar. x2 p2 minus p2 x2 is ih bar. x3 p3 minus p3 x3 is ih bar. Let me sum this side by side x dot p, my, notice that, as you usually do in the exam, if you drop the vectors, then you won't be able to finish this computation, because if you drop the vectors, you get scalars and you don't know what is the dot product, which means inner product, etc. So x dot p minus p dot x is 3 i h bar. Nice, isn't it? So I can write x dot p is equal to p dot x, minus 3 i h bar. No, no. I, I would like to express p dot x as x dot p minus 3 i h bar from here. So the, if I call this the second term, so what is that second term is now? It is xj x dot p pj uh, 
minus m minus plus plus three i h bar x dot p. So what is L squared? L squared is the first term minus the second term. The first term is this one, R squared, P squared, minus IH bar X dot P. That's the first term, minus the second term, minus XJ, X dot P, PJ, minus A little p dot x is x dot b minus. There is a minus and minus plus. That's right. That was a minus sign, right? Yeah. Sure. <coughs> because that was without the sign, so that was a minus sign there, right? Yes. So plus, indeed, so, 2IH for x dot p. So altogether, r squared minus uh, r squared p squared minus xj xp pj No, that was 3. Huh? That was 3. Plus minus and pl uh, plus three two i h bar x of p. Notice that this is the L squared. Immediately you com compare it against the classical expression. If you were in classical physics, this term wouldn't be there, and this would be jumping over because there is no operator thing. So it would be r squared p squared minus x dot p squared. We have this order which we have to take care of first, and there is an additional quantum piece, which is very quantum because there is h bar in the front. There's one more step left which I have to take care of. It is the following step. How do I jump over xj and put it just next to pj? I need the following commutation relations for this. In order to jump the xj over the x dot p, I need to compute that commutation relation. If I write this xk pk, so it is going to be xk xj pk, which is ih bar delta jk, which is ih bar xj, right? So that is the commutation relation. Then xj xp is xp xj plus ih bar xj. That is an identity I obtained from that commutation relation. So this one, let me check this one. Let me call this the third term. So what is this third, third term? It is x dot P x j plus i h bar x j times p j. Or x dot p squared plus i h bar x dot p. Wonderful. So I finish. What do I get? I get the following now. L squared is R squared P squared, the first term already there, and this is what's the so-called third term, minus X dot P squared, this one, minus IH bar plus IH bar altogether IH bar X dot P. So this is really the quantum mechanical L squared operator written in this fashion. 
Let me reduce it to the usual fashionable form to finish the thing. So what is x dot p? x dot p is the, the there is an r times the p projected along the unit vector, which is r times x dot p, which is i h bar, or h bar over i d by dr, right? Because it's the gradient operator projected along the radial direction. So it is minus i h bar r dr. Minus i h bar r d dr. How nice. So what is the i h bar x dot p? i h bar x dot p is i h bar is i h bar there as well. So if you write it as h bar over i, h bar squared r d dr. That is this term. i h bar x dot p is this additional term we have obtained. That's very quantum. What about the x dot p squared? x dot p squared is. There's minus, squared is plus i, uh, squared is minus, minus h bar squared, r d dr, r d dr. I have to write it that way, right? These are operators. I cannot do anything else. So, <clears throat> I'm more or less done. I will put it right here. Because I cannot move away. So what is it? L squared is R squared P squared. The first term, I H bar X dot P is H bar squared R D D R. The first term, that one. Minus x dot p squared plus r d by dr, r d by dr. Okay. Or let me move this to the left hand side. p squared is, if this goes to the left as h bar squared, 1 over r squared, r d by dr plus r, d by dr, r d by dr, plus l squared over r squared. Notice that the second term is very similar, exactly the same really, apart from the fact that l is an angular momentum operator, l squared over r squared then you are using Kepler problem that's there. The first term is so-called the radial momentum, and it's quite interesting because I will write it now as PR squared, quantum mechanical PR operator squared, of course, plus L squared over R squared. Now I claim that this PR is, PR is H bar over I, d by dr plus 1 over r, that operator. If I, let's check. If we take the, the square of this operator, whether we get that expression. Well, first of all, you may wish to simplify this expression a little bit. What is this? Let me use the color so that you can identify easily. Look at this. There is, if you enter this, Inside, you get 1 over r d by dr plus 1 over r d by dr r d by dr, right? That is what it is. What, let's complete this one. This one is what? d by dr plus r d squared dr squared, right? Operators, you have to carry, act on everything. This one. 
So it's 1 over r d by dr twice 2 over r d by dr plus d squared by dr squared. Wonderful, isn't it? So this thing, let's look at the entire thing. It is d squared by dr squared plus 2 over r d by dr. That's the square of this, really. If you take the square of this, h bar over i squared will give you minus h bar squared. That's there. The inside is d squared by dr squared, the second term, plus 1 over r squared, plus d by dr, 1 over r, plus 1 over r, d by dr, leaves you with this. So you indeed get the following expression. PR is this. Notice that there is an additional piece. Normally, in classical Keplerian physics, what you call the radial is something like that. This additional piece saves the fact that h bar over i d by dr is not Hermitian, and this is the Hermitian momentum operator. Okay, I'm finishing. Let me list the properties that I have obtained. PR, h bar over i, d by dr, 1 over r, is the radial Hermitian momentum. PR squared is minus h bar squared d squared d dr squared plus 2 over r. You're, you're going to need this for the radial equation hydrogen. And p squared is pr squared plus l squared plus r squared. And the total Hamiltonian now is p squared divided by 2m plus a Coulombic potential, for instance, this one which really does the job for you. So it is Vr plus L squared divided by R squared is what you get for the Coulomb Hamiltonian. And we can solve the common eigenvalue problem for this with L squared and Lz. L squared and Lz commute. We have demonstrated this. Because of the spherical symmetry, and the form of the kinetic energy, this commutes also with the L squared and LZ. So you have a compatible set of commuting operators. The Coulomb Hamiltonian, L squared and LZ, and you solve the common eigen problem, eigenvalue problem to get the psi and LM. So what is the result then? The result H, L squared, LZ, compatible set of commuting operators. The two is automatic. This is spherically symmetric automatic. And the form of the Coulomb Hamiltonian is this, PR squared plus VR plus L squared divided by R squared. And the eigenvectors are these. Eigenfunctions are psi and LM, R theta phi. And again, values are alpha squared divided by 2n squared mc squared. And these explicitly are given psi and lm 0 or theta phi is r and l, r y lm theta phi. For given m, notice that this n is the principal quantum number and it appears only itself in the energy. Given n, L runs from 0 to n minus 1. And given L, m runs between minus L and plus L. And that's the entire solution. It's all depend on this beautiful existence of radial Hermitian momentum operator, satisfying the usual canonical commutation relations, and that's Hamiltonian. 
And that's the end of this semester. It was uh, quite a rush, right, today? Okay. Have you seen this uh, radial Hermitian momentum discussion before in your undergraduate classes? I am sure most of you have seen it. That's a very crucial thing. Without that, it wouldn't be her mission. It's a very strange thing, right? The canonical pairing between x and px is h bar over i d by dx. Cartesian y is h bar over i d by dy. When you go to the radial, for spherical polar coordinates, radial distance is on the half line. It's not minus infinity to plus infinity, it's zero to infinity. And zero, the origin, of the radial variable is singular, really. So because at that point, you may lose the hermeticity. Hermeticity is not a property of the operators alone. It's a property of the space that you define the operator, because you go from one side to the other. So it is this important discussion is a good point that I want to finish this lecture. So we'll see in the exam. These are all will be covered in the exam, of course. You have to be, as you know it from your previous courses, I don't feel any, I don't feel bad about this, that you know it anyway. Okay, so that's it.